coming up today on Airborne. The FAA has approved Boeing's fix for the 787 batteries. And Harry's launches successfully. And the first production Citation 10 rolls out in Kansas. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The FAA took the next step in returning the Boeing 787 to flight last Friday by approving Boeing's design modifications for the 787 battery system. This week, the FAA will issue instructions to operators for making those changes and will publish in the Federal Register the final directive that will allow the 787 to return to service. The directive will take effect upon publication. The FAA will require airlines to install containment and venting systems for the main and auxiliary system batteries and to replace the batteries and their chargers with modified components. To assure proper installation, the FAA will closely monitor modifications of the aircraft in the U.S. fleet. Any return to service will only take place after the FAA accepts the work. Meanwhile, the French news service AFP reports that Japan plans to impose stricter safety requirements on the Dreamliner than will be recommended by the FAA. The paper reports that the Japanese Transport Ministry will require such things as remote monitoring of battery data, like voltage, and will also require more frequent battery inspections. Finally, the NTSB will hold a two-day investigative hearing into the January 7th Boeing 787 battery fire on April the 23rd through the 24th. Representatives of the FAA, Boeing, GSU ASA, and TALIS will testify and answer questions from NTSB board members and technical staff about the design, testing, certification, and operation of a lithium-ion battery on the Boeing 787 in the battery fire incident. Sunday evening saw Orbital Sciences Corporation achieve another significant milestone in NASA's plan to rely on American companies to launch supplies and astronauts to the International Space Station, with the successful first launch of the Antares rocket. Liftoff took place at 1700 Eastern Time from the new Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport Pad 0A at the agency's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. And Terry has delivered the equivalent mass of a spacecraft, a so-called mass-simulated payload, into Earth's orbit. The test flight demonstrated all operational aspects of the new Antares launcher, including the ascent to space and accurate delivery of a simulated payload to a target orbit the same launch profile it will use for upcoming cargo resupply missions to the International Space Station. Orbital is building and testing its Antares rocket and its Cygnus spacecraft under NASA's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program. After successful completion of a COTS demonstration mission to the station, Orbital will begin conducting eight planned cargo resupply flights to the orbiting laboratory through NASA's $1.9 billion CRS contract with the company. The first production unit of the new Citation 10 has been rolled out at Cessna's Wichita, Kansas manufacturing facility. First announced at MBAA in 2010, the new airplane is best known for its top speed of 0.935 Mach, which Cessna says makes it the fastest civilian aircraft in the world. Scott Ernest, Cessna CEO, said, quote, Speed is the reason for flight. It was true for Clyde Cessna in 1927, and it's true today. The Citation 10 is the perfect aircraft for customers wanting to move faster, be more efficient, and get where they need to be more quickly than ever before, end quote. The increased speed is not the only improvement for the flagship of the Citation fleet. The Citation 10 provides a lengthier cabin and a longer range of 3,242 nautical miles. The increased range translates into an aircraft which can easily handle a flight from New York to London. Employees at Cessna's Wichita Manufacturing Facility celebrated the rollout. Cessna expects certification later this year, with customer deliveries starting shortly thereafter. 
after an online petition gained dozens of signatures. Organizers of the Dayton Air Show have decided they will not stage a reenactment of the bombing of Hiroshima that the B-29 Enola Gay carried out on August 6, 1945. Tom Patton has that story. The reenactment became controversial after Dayton art curator Gabriella Pickett launched the online petition that objected to the, quote, glamorization of destruction, according to a report appearing in the Dayton Daily News. Pickett said the display did not reflect the city's image as a, quote, city of peace. The petition was available online and drew dozens of signatures, according to the paper. While air show organizers said that the reenactment was meant to showcase an historical event that in the long run saved more lives than it cost, some historians dispute that contention, saying the Japanese would have surrendered in World War II without the atomic bombing. Ron Katsuyama, past president of the Asian American Council, is one of those. He said the reenactment would not only be in bad taste, but, quote, sustains misinformation. Dayton Air Show spokeswoman Brenda Durfoot said the show, planned for late June, will still feature the Great Wall of Fire pyrotechnic show, and that Fifi, the B-29 that is the star of the reenactment, will still fly. But the Hiroshima reenactment is out. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Boeing will adjust the production rate for the 747-8 program from two airplanes to 1.75 airplanes per month because of lower market demand for larger passenger and freighter airplanes. The 747-8 family provides airlines with double digits improvements in fuel burn, operating costs, and emissions, while being 30% quieter and adding more capacity. Today, there are 110 orders for passenger and cargo versions of the 747-8, 46 of which have been delivered. The company expects long-term average growth in their air cargo market to resume in 2014 and forecasts a demand for 790 large airplanes, such as the 747-8 Intercontinental, to be delivered worldwide over the next 20 years. The production rate change is not expected to have a significant financial impact. You're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or our podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The Boise Weekly reports that an agreement has been reached that will reopen Hammer Flat near Boise, Idaho to hang gliders and paragliders beginning May 1st. The area had been a popular hang gliding spot for 30 years, but three years ago, the city of Boise and then the Idaho Department of Fish and Game took control of the area, considered crucial habitat for a variety of wildlife in the region, and padlocked the gates. Now with the Boise City Council voicing support for the sporting legacy of the area, the IDFG and the Idaho Hang Gliding Association have worked out a special permit that will allow hang gliding from May 1st to November 15th, when wintering deer do not depend on the area for a winter range. 
IHGA spokesman John Kangas says the warmer months suit the hang gliders just fine. And IDFG Regional Wildlife Habitat Manager Jerry Deal said that the association has convinced him that Hammer Flat was just not another place to hang glide or paraglide. Quote, it is special. They convinced me of that, he said. One day after President Obama unveiled his 2014 budget containing a new $100 per flight user fee, USPA wrote to the president explaining how such a fee would devastate businesses that operate skydiving airplanes. The new fee would apply to each flight by a turbine aircraft in controlled airspace. Ed Scott, USPA's executive director, said in the letter, quote, it is clear that no one within the administration understands that turbine jump planes routinely make up to 25 flights per day. An operator with one turbine airplane could pay $2,500 each day in user fees. An operator with two aircraft could pay $5,000 each day." End quote. USBA pointed out that those same operators already pay between $158 and $263 per aircraft per day in federal fuel taxes on jet fuel. USBA's letter described the new user fee as, quote, inequitable, duplicative, and requiring a new costly bureaucratic process to collect and assess the fee. Obviously, no business can survive new daily fees that run into the thousands of dollars, end quote. Well, it's Tuesday and time for our Aero Video of the Week. I don't mind. By the White House and the U.S. Congress working together since. Has it really come down to this? Who says you won't get to see the Blue Angels fly this season? Today's Aero Video of the Week should win an award for political satire. And if the Blues don't send its producers a personalized thank you, then they're not the top flight organization we know they are. This one is a must-see. Search YouTube for 2013 Paper Blue Angel Show. The National Aviation Hall of Fame has announced that it is the new steward and host of the prestigious annual Crossfield Award to encourage and recognize excellence in aerospace education. The A. Scott Crossfield Aerospace Education Teacher of the Year Award is presented to recognize and reward aerospace education classroom teachers for outstanding accomplishments in aerospace education and for possessing those honorable attributes we expect from American teachers. Nominations for the award are now open. Although the Crossfield Award is an award presented to a teacher, the accomplishments of the nominee need not be limited to the year for which the award is given. For more information, log on to www.nationalaviation.org. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And please join us again Friday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.